and a very warm welcome from us here at COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. This is the 12th in a series of webinars brought to you by the NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine, the National University Health System, and the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. My name is Claire Chong, and I am a third year medical student at the NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine. In this COVID-19 update from Singapore weekly webinar series, we will be sharing viewpoints and insights from leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialities and disciplines. It is now my honour to invite our programme director, who is also moderator for tonight's update. Recruited to establish an infectious diseases training unit here in Singapore, he became the first infectious diseases head of department at the Communicable Disease Centre here in 1992. He's also a visiting senior fellow of the Courage Fund at the university. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Allen. Thank you, Claire. Good evening and welcome to the 12th installment of our webinar, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. We hope this broadcast finds you well and acting responsibly as we move to the next phase in our pandemic response. Don't let your guard down. Dengue is lurking along with SARS-CoV-2. Be careful. Our customary format will be used this week. We begin with a review of regional and international epidemiology by Professor Dale Fisher, then an in-depth talk by our visiting guest expert. This week, it's Professor Heidi Larson. Claire and I will then uh, present your questions to our guest speaker, and then there'll be an update of current events by Dale and a, a preview of next week's guest expert and a reveal of the mystery pandemic song of the week. Please send in your questions and your country, uh, along with your country of origin, please. We welcome your comments. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dale Fisher, Professor of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Yang Lu Lin School of Medicine, Senior Consultant, Division of Infectious Diseases, National University Hospital, and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. So um, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll start with uh, the way we usually start, looking at the Johns Hopkins University dashboard. Um, and you can see that for the first time in a week, the week being from the 18th of June to the 25th of June uh, today, it's, uh, it's over a million. So you remember the graphic I showed everyone last week was that a million was turning over about every eight days. So it's, it's obviously quickening up while the, the death rate remains uh, around 30, 35,000 in the week. Um, countries uh, remain the same, uh, US, Brazil, Russia, India, UK, like that. So um, moving on, uh, this is the, again, the global epi curve you're all familiar with. Uh, you can see that most of the contribution to the, to the case numbers uh, and indeed the deaths is, is the yellow areas. So this is the, the Americas, the, Pan-American uh, Health Organization um, region of WHO. Um, and the, the numbers are running at around uh, 160,000 a day. Um, and, and the deaths are sitting around four or 5,000. I'm just wondering if that's starting to upturn a little bit. Uh, we can watch that over the next, the next few weeks. Um, and again, the, uh, each region, so Afro running at about uh, 8,000 cases a day and around 200 deaths. Um, Eastern Mediterranean uh, and, and Europe, all, all sitting at around 20,000 now. Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Europe, uh, Southeast Asian region. Uh, the, the outliers are Apaho, which are up at, uh, up at uh, pushing 100,000 um, every day. Uh, deaths around two or 3,000. Whereas on, on our side of the world, it's uh, obviously much smaller numbers in around, around 1,000 a day with, with very few deaths. We'll talk a bit more about that later. So the countries probably of, of the largest concern numerically is this, uh, this orange one, which is the US. And, and you can see um, that it's done what we had all feared. There was a, a general fall in cases from a peak of 30,000 down to 20,000 per day. Uh, we have had that tick up, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, Brazil is, is, is moving along somewhat uncontrollably, as is, uh, as is in India. So I'll talk about each of those, those individually. So India first had its, uh, its lockdown in March, when really there were only hundreds of cases. They, they got in quite early, but uh, 
you can see it hasn't been particularly successful. Um, they're now having about 15,000 cases a day um, with, with, with around uh, uh, three or 400 deaths here. Um, the uh, testing rates are, 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 are not, not too bad where most of the cases are in Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and, and uh, down the south and also in Delhi. Um, Chennai has, has been recently, was the first place to be re-locked down in, in, in India. So, so they've, uh, they've, because of a surge in cases there, they've had to, to go backwards a bit. There's not a lot of test, uh, probably the testing rates aren't what they should be up in these more Northern states, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, um, uh, West Bengal. So, so this is um, really the, the state of, of, of play in, in India. Testing positivity rates about 6.8%. Uh, as we've said in previous episodes, we like it the lower the better. Um, certainly, around two, three percent is uh, is is a is a nice level. So, certainly not the worst in the world. But there, there is a suggestion there that uh, they could do more testing. Their neighbour, uh, Pakistan, um, that also had an early lockdown in March, and you can see by the the notch here, that's when they they undid their lockdowns. So. There was relative control, and then it's it's really spiked up in uh, about a month ago when they when when they undid things. They've reopened their borders with uh, with Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, I gather they're fairly important for for trade and, and testing is really a bit underdone in this country as well. The positivity rate is 15.8%. Um, uh, one of their uh, efforts recently has been to try and get some flights happening because they've got a lot of uh, people stranded abroad and they're trying to get them get them home. So um, despite the high rates here of 6,000 cases a day, the, these people will still be swabbed and go into quarantine when they come back. Um, Brazil, we featured this uh, a few weeks ago, so I won't go into it too much, but, but clearly this staggering uh, 40,000 cases a day, 1,000 deaths a day, uh, fairly relentless. Um, progression of disease there. Uh, if you do a test, it's 31% chance of it being positive. So that's, that's I think, the highest in the world. So this is uh, a bit of a problem. And, and even the reporting, that this is probably a, a gross overestimate of their positive tests that day because, uh, be, because of reporting lags. So, so that's just a, a little bit on, on Brazil and, and these uh, favelas, which are, are very challenging. So let's look at USA and, and what, what's actually happening there. We've got uh, this May 2025 20, was uh, the, the day uh, George Floyd was, was killed. So, and we, we're all very familiar with all the, the marches and, and, uh, and things that happened afterwards. But, but if, you, if you want to explain this tick up, it being about uh, two or three weeks before this, this jump, it's, uh, it's pretty consistent, isn't it? So, so you'd have to say that that all these uh, um, all these mass gatherings and, and yelling and things had contributed. Looking state by state, Florida is of great concern now. Four thousand cases a day, and, and again you can see it's gone up in that same time frame as has Arizona at, at around three thousand cases a day. Um, California's been a bit more of a steady one, but again you can see it's it's fairly fairly relentless, but probably not so much related to the, to the marches. Texas, likewise, uh, a very recent kick up. Um, and the same with, with Nevada, although the, the numbers are small, but, uh, but, but the increase is very large. The, 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 the famous one coming down is, is New York, uh, buck, bucking the trends because of these problems they had uh, through April with, with up to around 10,000 cases a day. So just another couple of countries of interest this week, I think, is, uh, is Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi's got, uh, they have had out, uh, the, the Singapore problem. They've got about 7.7 .7 million foreign workers there from India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and, and Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh, there's been about 14,000 uh, Bangladeshi workers infected, including 220 deaths uh, in, in the foreign workers. Um, you can see what what uh, what happened here. They had their lockdown. It was it was undone here, um, as as so many countries have found. It's premature, and, and once that uh, 
is undone, you get this surge of cases. So the the hard, I guess, is the is is the pressing thing that um, uh, I mentioned a week or two ago that that Umrah has been been cancelled, but. Uh, the Hajj is going to go ahead, but it's going to be very limited. It normally takes over 2 million people um, on this pilgrimage to, to Mecca. Um, so it's only going to be limited to, to people living in Saudi Arabia. So they're not going to be taking um, international visitors for this. Um, there's going to be quarantine before and after the Hajj. Everyone will have to have a test before they do it. You're not allowed to go on it if you're over 65. And because there's only going to be a few thousand instead of two million, they feel they'll be able to do social distancing. So, so that's a little bit uh, about that. Uh, not such a good testing positivity rate at, at 10% across the country. Uh, this is very interesting, this, uh, this outbreak again that I've mentioned in, in the last week or so. Um, so this Jinfadi wholesale market is, um, it's actually, a, 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 it's a wholesale market. It's, it's, Asia's largest. It supplies 80% of Beijing's fresh food. Um, it has 15,000 people visit it and 3,000 trucks visit it every day. Uh, it, it sits here, so it's quite near the center of, of Beijing. Um, it's huge. It's got, it's 276 acres across it, which uh, I've read is the same as 157 soccer pitches. So if you can imagine that being in, in this area here, so this red spot is the, the seafood area. The yellow is, is other markets where certainly they've got other meats and things. Um, now, so, so what did they find? Um, they obviously found cases. They're, they're up to about um, 250 cases linked to the market now. Um, and, but they've done that by a mass testing, like anyone in the neighborhood, anyone that had visited it in the last two weeks, all got swabs, I think about two and a half million swabs. So, so it's, um, they're doing what, what China does with swabbing. The capacity in Beijing for swabbing is about 500,000 tests a day. So that's, that's to be envied. Um, and they've, they've built this up. A lot of personnel have come from other provinces to help with this mass effort as well. So what they found was, as well as the cases, they found that they were able to find virus on the, on the chopping boards of the salmon. So. So uh, I don't know the genotyping results, but I hear it's the, the European strain. So there's a, there's a, a belief that it came in on the, on the salmon. Um, I've spoken to some food experts and that's actually extremely unlikely because salmon in, in, in most parts is, uh, is completely mechanically managed. It's the, there's no human contact. All the fish are the same size because they're farmed uh, and there's machines that do all the all the gutting and, and, and things and put them into vacuum sealed containers. It's not impossible, but it's just unlikely. And it's, it's possibly more likely that it was um, some, something else from somewhere else in the market because it's very conceivable that it's on chicken or pork or, and we know about the meat packing, um, our meat packer outbreaks in, uh, you know, all over the world, a big one in Germany now and, and others in um, South America and in the U S so so anyway, uh, lots of theories going around. Uh, I, I, I'm probably leaning towards it, it. It was a food because I hadn't had a case for 55 days. But the other, the other theory is that it came on um, uh, asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic people. But 50 days is, is like five or 10 generations so, uh, to go undetected. So anyway, they're, they're, they're the theories. Um, so just moving along, this is the salmon exporters to China. So you can see Chile, Norway, yeah, the red ones are the, uh, of this year. Uh, and, and these numbers are in um, million kilos. So they really do import a lot of fish. And uh, the, the countries being Chile, Norway, US, Russia, certainly countries with, with plenty of COVID around. So, so it is a, a, an interesting theory. Actually, China has, has stopped all its imports of, of salmon since this event. Uh, quick one on, on DRC, basically to say 3,400 cases in the North Kivu outbreak, 24 cases in the Equator outbreak on the other side of the country. But this is what I wanted to show you, that we're now at day zero toward the end of the outbreak. And this is as of yesterday. So this outbreak is now declared over. It's been 58 days. Um, which uh, 
is basically two incubation periods plus the time for the, uh, the last survivor to clear the virus. So that worked out to 58 days. So well done, uh, that, that side of DRC. Uh, very challenging. And they're now trying to manage uh, COVID uh, or trying to manage the Ebola outbreak in a COVID setting. So let's go to Singapore. Quick one on the mobility trends. June 2 was when the circuit breaker came off. Um, so you can see people are coming back, but it's not as bad as I had had feared. The numbers are still quite down from the, the baseline back in back in January. So, so people are still not going out as much as they would, and that's what we want. Uh, our three ep epidemic curves, very little in travellers. The next one is community cases, and again, single digits there, so that's something to look forward to. And dormitory residents, there's obviously a fall in activity in, in those, but there's still some quite complex uh, formulas around serology and swabbing before we can really see the dorms cleared um, so that we know that as, uh, uh, as dormitory uh, residents come out, then they, they won't be carrying the disease. And this is the last one, just to see the current state of play in Singapore. One patient in ICU, 188 in general wards across all the, the hospitals of the country, 6,000 in isolation facilities, and still 26 only that have passed away from COVID. Back to you, David, thanks. Great, Dale, thank you. Um, I want you to remember to send your questions uh, in the country from which you're watching uh, via the uh, question and answer tool at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll see it there. Um, and it's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest expert tonight. Uh, she is Professor uh, Heidi Larson, uh, Professor of Anthropology, Risk and Decision Science, Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's also Associate Professor, Department of Global Health, at the University of Washington. Uh, she's founding director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the World Health Organization Center of Excellence, and she's a friend of Singapore. The title of her talk tonight, The State of Vaccine Confidence in the Age of COVID-19. Prof. Larson, over to you. Thanks, David, and, and thanks also for the, uh, Dale, for the, the very thorough and, and constantly evolving uh, update on the COVID situation. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, vaccine confidence in the age of COVID, uh, partly the background about where we are with vaccine confidence, but also in terms of anticipating uh, a potential vaccine. Um, the Vaccine Confidence Project, uh, as David mentioned, uh, I founded uh, 10 years ago at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I had been working quite a bit on the front lines with uh, vaccine programs and introducing new vaccines and saw this growing trend of resistance questioning and different types of issues than the usual access issues. So the Vaccine Confidence Project is uh, aims to globally map and investigate um, what are the nature and scope of issues that are uh, interfering with uh, public acceptance of vaccines, or in particular, a vaccine. Um, and what we found is that it's really trust in vaccines is about much more than the product. It's about confidence in the products, certainly. It's about confidence in the providers and the interaction and, and trust with the healthcare system. And then it's also confidence in policymakers and systems and government. All those, what we call the trust chain, affect confidence. And historic confidence issues affect contemporary and future um, issues. So our challenges um, right now on top of the background issues is COVID. Um, and it's not just about anticipating a potential COVID vaccine, but the, uh, the demands of COVID and the COVID response, particularly with lockdown and trying to, to mitigate the spread, have had serious implications for people's access to other health interventions and care. And one of them is really basic childhood vaccine. And this is from the Mises Rubella Initiative. More than 117 million are at risk of missing out on measles 
vaccines as COVID-19 surges, and that's a global issue. I'm based here in London, and we have over 15% even here of children who have missed basic vaccines. And what we don't want is massive measles outbreaks, diphtheria, on top of already existing issues with COVID. In the US, one of the places they've seen um, the, the drop in uptake is the drop in ordering um, vaccines. So it's, it's quite a knock-on effect in terms of supply system. And part of it is, is the upstream supply system has been disrupted. So COVID and the impacts of it have had multiplier effects, um, as we know, well beyond health even. Um, but these are some of the things that in preparedness, a number of people have been um, encouraging preparedness at a systems level, but somehow when it hits, uh, it takes a different, um, it's a different crisis than you expect. Um, on top of it is we have this background of anti-vaccine sentiment that has been growing slowly uh, for a long time. I started working on this 20 years ago uh, while in UNICEF um, in a building trust in vaccines initiative, but it was a very slow burn uh, at the edges, some questioning uh, and concerns about vaccines, about safety, about the numbers of vaccines, do we really need them all? and then occasional vaccine scares, and then enter the social media environment, which made all the, a lot of those concerns amplify in ways that we were really not prepared for. This is just in uh, Australia. And I put this one up because it shows how these uh, movements and these questioning issues, which is part of our challenge, um, they morph into whatever the, the issue of the day is. So th this particular protest is everything from anti-5G, which is one of the, the believed sources and causes for COVID among some circles. It's about his other anti-vaccine issues. So some of the underlying issues, the, the um, questions about bleach-related um, treatments, th these are, have been going on for a long time. Now it's 5G. It was, uh, H1N1 was about, it must have been caused by 3G, SARS must have been caused by 4G. These are recurrent issues that sleep when they don't have an opportunity and they're back when there is one. So we have in terms of the landscape, both for the current uh, vaccine confidence, as well as the context in which we're trying to build a preparedness and confidence in an upcoming new vaccine, um, we're faced with emotions, we're faced with attitudes, uh, and we're faced with a genuine access challenge. Um, in, as you see, uh, Gabby, WHO and UNICEF, um, say 80 million children. We also heard about 117 million for measles alone. Um, but then these emotions and attitudes weigh in. But we have an opportunity in COVID also, and that's to recognize that this is the environment that we're in right now and use it as we build, um, make sure that children start to get their routine vaccines and start to rebuild trust in the system and people's trust in how the government is handling COVID response will weigh in and absolutely influence their willingness to take a, a COVID vaccine. They're highly related. Another phenomenon, and we have lessons to learn from other pandemics like H1N1. What, uh, this is a nice uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's, it's by a, a, a doctor uh, who writes about the, what she calls the emotional epidemiology of influenza vaccine. Initially, when the threat is real and tangible, people were asking, how do I get a vaccine? As that fades and the vaccine was available, people didn't want it anymore. They didn't feel anymore that the imminent threat was worth the potential, any potential risk of a vaccine. There is more broadly in the vaccine landscape confidence landscape, um, always more anxiety around newer vaccines. So that's one thing we'll have to prepare for and try to uh, anticipate. 
but that also changes and sentiments change more than, more than ever in the context of social media. Safety is probably one of the biggest concerns. Um, and this is, sorry, it came up twice here, but uh, in 2010, uh, Steve Black and Reno Rapoli and a group of scientists convened saying, what went wrong with H1N1 uh, vaccine? Why didn't we have the uptake that we anticipated af after we had rushed making this vaccine? And it was a, it's an excellent summary, and it also reflects on uh, issues with vaccine confidence more broadly. And I think that what we've learned from the emotional epidemiology and the other lessons from previous pandemics, we need to internalize them and integrate them into our communication moving forward. As I mentioned, uh, safety is, is, prob is probably the top anxiety globally. And one of the biggest uh, recurring anxieties that we're hearing about from publics. At the Vaccine Confidence Project, we use multiple types, uh, multiple methods of data collection. We do 24 seven uh, scanning of social and, and news media monitoring since 10 years. We archive it all, we watch patterns of change. We also developed what we call the Vaccine Confidence Index, which we run globally. And this particular slide on the screen shows what our index found in 2015 and how it compares to the index when we ran it globally in 2018. As you can see, sentiments change, perceptions change. This is, um, the question is, do you uh, agree that vaccines are safe? And the, the dark red is don't agree, the dark blue is do agree. And you can see just in those few years, um, things have changed. Uh, Africa has more questions. Some of uh, the US has more questions. Asia is harder to see because it's smaller country, it's smaller on the map, but there are a lot of dynamic changes in vaccine safety. So we do need to keep our finger on the pulse of what the issues are and how they're evolving. Uh, in uh, 2018, the Wellcome Trust did a, their first, what they call their global monitor on public trust in health and science. And they adopted our vaccine confidence index for a special chapter that was uh, dedicated to vaccines because it really is uh, an indicator, a window on system trust. And as you can see, um, actually, uh, after Europe, which was the, is the most skeptical, uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia, they broke this down to some of the World Bank sub-regional um, areas. But it is not straightforward in terms of public confidence in vaccines. The yellow is strongly agree, and there's a lot of ambiguity in the middle. So these trust issues are related to, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of systems issues, tr relationship issues with the health provider, as well as the confidence in the specific vaccine. But it's also about confidence in the product. And in, in this case, these issues are much more related to um, it, it, fake vaccines, uh, con confidence in the systems. There were a couple of scandals in China, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, but there's also real risks. I mean, there are uh, production and safety risks that are by those who purposely fake a vaccine, but then there are inadequate safety measures in the in production uh, that need to be uh, need improved regulatory. Um, but then you do have risks sometimes, and one of our other challenges with vaccines is vaccines are not risk free. And we have publics now that are incredibly demanding about a risk-free um, vaccine and risk-free in general. And this uh, um, episode with the uh, risk that was found with the dengue, the new dengue vaccine vaccine, that in fact, if you didn't have uh, any previous exposure to dengue, even in an endemic uh, context, there was a, a risk that you could get more serious illness than not. Well, that created a public outrage, uh, very different from how Brazil handled this news of the risk. They uh, updated their 
their um, guidance to healthcare workers, they trained them, they changed the recommendation and carried on. Philippines had an absolutely different um, political outrage that uh, took advantage of this real risk, but amplified it into a much bigger issue. Um, this again is our vaccine confidence index because we had the baseline global index um, and that's at 2015. And you can see that uh, in 2015, uh, the Philippines was like a poster child of positive confidence in the importance, safety, and even effectiveness of vaccines. And that dropped dramatically after the dengue vaccine. So one vaccine issue can have a knock-on effect on confidence more broadly. Even beyond the vaccines, there were refusals of um, deworming medicine in the school because they didn't trust the health program. Uh, measles outbreaks started happening. So these even individual outbreaks can have a knock-on effect. I mean, even individual risks. That's something we have to be very alert to as we anticipate also a new COVID vaccine. I just wanna point out in the last one, what was interesting to me is that even the uh, compatibility of religious beliefs uh, with vaccines dropped. And people in the Philippines felt like vaccines had become less compatible with their religious beliefs. How did that happen? Well, actually religious beliefs are about faith. They're about trust and they had absolutely lost trust. And the last thing I'll look at is the uncertainty uh, we have a lot of uncertainty around the uh, COVID. We're learning every day about symptoms, about uh, uh, what the knock-on effects with health and immune systems are, the spread. Uh, it's a constantly evolving environment on top of the fact that there's already uh, uncertainty with the different, um, some things we don't know. And even among science, we have uh, uncertainty. In this environment, opinions are very volatile. One thing we're doing is running uh, pulse surveys with Public Health England, and we do biweekly briefs to Public Health England, uh, both from highlights of things we're learning from social media monitoring, as well as our surveys that have implications for their policies and briefs. As you can see, at some points, the different color bars are different periods of time. And there are some times where hand washing was much more the issue and concern of the day and other times it was social distancing or hand sanitization. So the important thing is the volatility of issues and sentiment, which is why one study with the public a month, two months, four months ago in this kind of environment isn't good enough. These sentiments change constantly. Um, we've run a number of surveys and some colleagues in France also uh, have in terms of if a vaccine for SARS uh, against SARS COVID or COVID-19 also more commonly called becomes available, 26% of respondents in France said they would not use it. That's similar um, to the US, but then there's a lot of variety across countries. Uh, again, uh, the, the French um, researchers say, you know, we need to remember H1N1 and the debates around vaccine safety because of the concern, even with H1N1 vaccine, it was made too hastily and not tested enough. In all of our global social media monitoring, the most common concern is um, it, they're making it too fast, it can't be safe. We need to manage that anxiety. So, so I have a few a quick um, uh, results from some of the, the surveys. This is, these are the acceptance levels of other countries, oops, um, uh, if there were a vaccine available, um, if and when. So let's see, Singapore is, uh, you're on the higher end, not the highest, um, but it uh, changes. We also asked, uh, this was with, with colleagues uh, at C uh, City University of New York, um, uh, the government and business community in my country are working together to restart. This is about another dimension of trust. And what the um, CUNY 
group and, and polling group they were working with found is that these things are correlated with. What was interesting is also employers' recommendation um, because some people, uh, who do you trust? Because these are the kind of things we need to know now before we have a vaccine, because where we find they don't have trust and where they do can influence how you uh, shape your delivery. Uh, these were some of the other ones that uh, we ran um, about uh, not sure yes or no about a vaccine. Uh, Austria, 80% uh, would accept, meaning 20% wouldn't. Um, or were ambiguous, um, and the UK, France, as we saw, and Aust Australia uh, was among the higher, but this was run in mid-March, and already um, we've done waves since then, and they've changed regularly. In the UK, for instance, uh, it was 0.05, saying they would not take a vaccine um, when the uh, the numbers of fatalities was high, it's now up to 10% saying no as we're starting to plateau. So these are, as we I mentioned with the previous um, uh, reference to emotional epidemiology, this is a key issue. And the last thing is we're paying more and more attention to emotions. And I just wanted to end on a bit of a happier note uh, in the context of all this fear and anxiety and sadness and loneliness for many people in the, in the lockdown, we saw uh, in the social media exchanges this shift um, at one point when we were really in the thick of things in mid-March here um, with uh, when the lockdown really started, the love sentiments and affection and caring um, came in in ways that were really um, uh, extraordinary. So we sh these are the kinds of sentiments we need to build on and, and keep that um, uh, sentiment there. And this is just our website. We have a lot more on there and we'll be increasingly populated with new uh, information on COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much. We very much appreciate you, you uh, being with us today. And I'll let our audience know that our time is somewhat short with Professor Larson. She has another webinar to attend. So we're going to jump right into our questions. Um, and I'm going to take the, uh, uh, the moderator's prerogative and ask the first question. And then I'll turn it over to Claire. Uh, so what becomes uh, of the information gathered by the Vaccine Confidence Project? Is there an arm of, uh, of your entity to intervene and or do you share the, uh, the information with others and hope they act? Well, um, as I was mentioning about with Public Health England, we do do a policy brief uh, guidance based on what we're, um, what we're seeing. Uh, some of it is been asked for. So we have a mix of um, areas where we provide the information because we think it's important. We'll contact uh, whenever we scan, we're constantly scanning um, all, all countries for emerging issues. And if we see something coming up that we think needs more urgent attention, we will directly contact the Ministry of Health or um, the Vaccine Safety Group at WHO or relevant, relevant bodies. Um, having been working on this for 20 years, we've established a pretty strong network globally with local programs, uh, you know, UNIS UN agencies, UNICEF, WHO, um, and as well as with uh, some NGO networks that are working more at community level. So to the extent um, that, and, and collaborating researchers. So it is a mix in some situations, like with Laos, we're starting a regular relationship, they've asked for regular briefs and monitoring. So it's a mix of proactive and de demand. Excellent. Claire, do you have a question? Mm, we do. Hi, Prof Larson. So Hi. one question we have is, is there a state between vaccine hesitancy and acceptance, perhaps like a curve for adoption or a journey that you have charted in your own research? And so is that the group of people that the Vaccine Confidence Project is trying to save from the anti-vaccine rumors? 
Well, there's a spectrum from uh, the reason we've chosen confidence as our rather than hesitancy for our work is that you can have 0% confidence and you can have 100% confidence. And the hesitancy is in the middle, the ambiguity there. And I think um, it's really this undecided group that we need to really be more responsive to. Because in this current environment where the world, particularly in, in media, is framed as anti or pro, many of the concerned mothers and very genuine uh, questions they have um, feel that they're labeled as anti-vaccine when they just try to ask a, a question. And they tell me, you know, we feel demonized. We're not, um, we're not crazy or, or anti-vaccine in any sense. We just have some genuine questions. And I think we're really at risk of losing this middle group um, and keeping that conversation going. So I, I really urge having some empathy with, with young parents who are going through a difficult time with the barrage of very confusing and sometimes conflicting information. So um, what's unique about vaccines? This was recently an article in The Atlantic. Uh, what's unique about vaccines in general and COVID-19 vaccines specifically, which make them such an attractive target for rumors, even before it's available? Well, it's been one of the big questions we launched on in, in the Vaccine Confidence Project. And I think it comes down to a few core things. One, vaccines are highly embedded in government. Um, they touch every single individual on the planet. Um, they are involved being counted. They involve, uh, and they're largely produced by big business. And anyone who has any issue with government, with being counted, with big business, uh, and we have plenty of that anxiety in the world today, um, it makes vaccines very vulnerable. It's also from the very first smallpox vaccine uh, been perceived as not natural. There's something invasive about the principle of it. The old uh, graphics from the anti-vaccine leagues in the 1800s, you know, are all about it being against God's plan. And the other aspect is we have a very strong pro-nature back to mother earth um, movement going on in the world among young mothers, among societies, anti-chemical, anti-additives, anti-adjuvants, and it's really uh, becoming quite a challenge. And we already have kind of organic alternatives uh, from presidents in Africa and, and, and senior people in India and certainly um, a lot of other countries um, around the world are purporting different kinds of natural alternatives. And while they can help uh, health, to some healthy food and, and exercise in natural ways, the natural approaches are just not gonna stop a virus from infecting. We know you have another meeting to attend. Uh, we are very grateful for you sharing your excellent and much needed work in these troubling times. Um, and so we're gonna let you go and hopefully we'll find a format to where we can ask more questions for you. Great. Good. And right. thanks. Apologies for the technical. No, that's quite <laughs> all right. Good, good okay. luck with your next session. And now Cheers. we'll move Thank to Dale's you. summary of the week's thanks. event. Over to you, Dale. Thanks. So um, thanks, everyone. There's been a lot of good uh, positive feedback about uh, the, the talking points. It's uh, from the time uh, we finished the webinar, I start wondering what we're going to talk about next week. Um, so on that note, if anyone's got something that they think might be, be interesting, do please send it along. This week, um, I, and, and that particularly means people that are doing special efforts in, in COVID or, or, or happy stories, um, quirky things, that's, uh, that's all good. Today, I want to talk about national performances, as well as uh, risk communications, community engagement again, because there's some, some things happened there. So. You remember I showed this slide uh, last week, and this was really to, to dedicate what is generally felt to be an infection fatality rate uh, by, I guess, natural, uh, natural circumstances. But you can see that, that most cases aren't diagnosed, right? So these other blue ones are the ones that are symptomatic and undetected. 
and they, they don't, for whatever reason, they don't get diagnosed. Uh, they don't present to a doctor or particularly if it's an overwhelmed health system, there might not be, be testing capacity. And then these yellow ones down the bottom are, are asymptomatic people. And, and these are all based on, on serology studies where there's lots of serology coming out from a number of countries now showing that, that uh, ob obviously the percentage of, of seropositive people is much greater than, than those diagnosed. And you can see in this instance in the US that was estimated at about sevenfold uh, more uh, diagnosed on serology than on, than on testing. So this is why uh, you've heard me say several times that cases uh, are not a good indicator. They're a very convenient indicator, but they're influenced by, by so many things. Um, so it, it's, it, it's guaranteed to be an underestimate. So um, this came out in the Straits Times today, actually. And, and it, it, it kind of demonstrates that point that where, where here's the total number of cases here, um, here's the deaths. So if you divide the deaths by the cases, you get these sort of numbers here now. Now we know the mortality rate is, is not this high because we know about seven times as many people are gonna get uh, 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 the disease uh, than, than get diagnosed. So you could argue then that perhaps this one's the best, which is deaths per million. Because you can see in this example, uh, US, for instance, should be ranked up much higher, uh, and and indeed even Singapore should be higher than it's than it's than it's ranked here. So I, I think it's um, useful, and and I'll tell you why. Um, this is about cases are not a good indication of of how you're going. Now I mentioned again last week that I I see this as what success looks like. So this is. Career overall, you know, here's Seoul and Incheon, and it's a very flat curve, and it's running at about uh, I think 50 or 60 for the whole country, uh, 20 per day in in Seoul and and less in in Incheon, but the fact is it doesn't have that exponential upward curve. Now I've had some uh, some chats with uh, YYTO who who leads the uh, Sorsui Hock School of Public Health at, at National University of Singapore. And he's put together, I paraphrased a little bit, but these are, uh, are what he put, put out as, as indicators. Now, they could be indicators for readiness for reversing lockdown, and I think that's how he was couching it. But you could also use it as, as a national performance. Um, and again, I'll say again, cases are much more convenient. But actually, what we want to be able to do is detect and break transmission chains which is what we were quite good at before the circuit breaker and what Korea and other successful countries are doing. Minimizing death and severe complications. So this is, uh, again, something going okay. Hospital acquired COVID, um, health, protecting healthcare workers and indeed protecting other patients in, in hospital. This is a very important measure. But beyond health, there's financial safety to minimize disincentives to an individual presenting. You don't want to have a person to lose his income because he's put into quarantine or because he's had to be admitted to hospital or put in isolation or, or something like that. So you need those in place, again, to make, make your system work uh, uh, optimally. But then also there's, there's the higher level fiscal support, and this is for individuals or, or companies to support livelihoods. There's no good in, in, in preventing all this disease yet uh, everyone's unemployed and the companies have all dissolved. Then there's the supply chains. Are you putting enough effort into those? Um, and, and then there's protection and support for the most vulnerable and neglected populations in the community. So this is his, um, his seven points, which um, uh, I think everyone will agree are, are, are very valid. And, and if, if your country is doing all these things well, then that, that carries a lot more weight than, um, than the number of cases. I, I would add in some, some others, and I, I call these enablers. Is your leadership coordinated, nimble, intersectoral, functional, and is it connected to the ground? Is it hearing what the people are saying? What's your testing like? Are you, do you have capacity to test aggressively, broadly? What's your, one, uh, one uh, measurable could be the percentage of positives. 
or the number of swabs per million population. Again, as an isolated figure, it just tells you about, uh, just tells you what it is, but, but this could be one of, one of many metrics. What's your surge capacity? What's your EMD, emergency department capacity? Um, your fever facility capacity, isolation rooms, cohort wards, isolation facilities, ICU beds and ventilators, uh, your public health surge. You, if you get too many cases, do you run out of co contact traces and quarantine facilities? A, a, a common one we use in Ebola is the number of cases diagnosed in quarantine. So if you're identifying all the contacts and all your cases come from those contacts, then that's, uh, that's a tremendously good sign. Um, and the RCCE, the Risk Communications Community Engagement, is that consistent? Is it honoured? Is it honest? And is it accurate? So um, I, I think uh, it's really just, just something to think about. I, I know we need to count cases, but I, I don't think we should just say, oh, look, there's a lot of cases, they're not doing very well because I think there's actually about 10 or 12 um, more deep metrics, which would be a better measure of a country's performance. Um, I'm not advocating we get rid of cases. I just uh, am advocating that there's a lot more to it when, you, when you're uh, looking at this and probably when we all review the performance um, in fighting this, uh, this pandemic, then, then these will be some of the criteria. The other thing I wanted to talk about tonight was risk communications, community engagement. You've seen this graphic before. This is a famous uh, go on slide, which highlights the, uh, the main pillars of an outbreak response being case management, epidemiology, logistics, and RCCE. And this all needs to be coordinated and psychosocial support, maintenance of regular health services and, and laboratory are all, uh, are all key to, to, to the pillars and the, the total outbreak response. So I'm telling, I'm, I'm going through this because I want to just focus on RCCE. Uh, we, we know there's, uh, we've been putting out lots of posters. This is really to help, help the uh, dormitory workers uh, know what they can do to help themselves. Um, coming down, coming to the clinic if they're sick or what symptoms to look out for, but also how to protect themselves. Um, so this is the most simple version. Um, the getting more technical, you can uh, on this particular website of Tanwajiers is is kite song. Um, so it's in in seven languages, and you can click on that, and then you can go to various information uh, that, that and we update these these fairly regularly depending on what the messages are of the day. And then there's face to face, so that we can. Uh, leveraging messaging is, is very important. So, so we would get, get men down, uh, communicate with them, and then they deliver that message to their, to their own uh, floors in the dormitory, to their own rooms in the dormitory. Uh, taking it another step further, we've got, uh, got a security guard here who's uh, getting right into it. Uh, wished he was wearing a bit more PPE, but, but nonetheless, uh, that uh, pe people really getting engaged um, to, uh, to deliver the right messages. It's absolutely fundamental. And this is uh, another one in the, the, the factory converted dormitories. Um, this is a, a hand hygiene um, exercise. Now, let me tell you why I'm telling you about all this. It's because I got this um, excellent uh, video the other day. Um, it's, uh, it, it was, uh, I, I guess, the brainchild of, uh, of these two doctors. These are both in the the pain management clinic of, uh, of NUH. They're one of, of our hundreds of volunteers that are, are working out in the dormitory. So for the first time ever, I'm gonna show you a video next. Now it's been edited by, by Joe Augustine, who's the technical support for this show. And the raw materials were, were provided by, by Michael Ung, who's another volunteer. He's, at the, uh, he's actually NUH ONG Ops and he's been out in the dormitories for nearly three months now. So what you're gonna see, I'm not gonna talk over the video, but it's, um, it's, it's, I don't really understand it actually. It's sort of a Tai Chi breathing thing and it's really engaging these men that have been, actually been in under lockdown for, for 10 weeks and it's very important for their, for their physical and mental health to actually uh, uh, be, more active. So, so this was a, a recent uh, effort. Now, 
This is on the basketball court of one of the dormitories. You'll see a sign which is going in and out, and that's to, to, to do the, the soothing breathing. You'll see the, these two doctors that are there um, uh, co coordinating all the, the movements that they do. Uh, and then, as I was just describing about how you leverage up, so these are all the leads within the dorms. Uh, they then go back to their rooms and do it with, with, the, with the, the men in their room. So this is a way we can get everybody to do it when, when you're in a dormitory of many thousands. So uh, this goes for two or three minutes. Uh, I really thought it was very, very uh, nice when I, when I saw it. So uh, I hope you like it. There's a spot in the middle where we blurred all their names because they, sub they actually submitted the video. Uh, but we thought for privacy, we, we might blur them. So uh, keep a lookout for those features. And, and Joe, if you're there, if you could start the video. <laughs> I hope you liked it. Uh, the, the, these guys have done it really tough for, for 10 weeks. You can see the, the, li the living circumstances, which uh, I can assure you are, there's lots of plans to improve those. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's really, um, uh, I, I think, touching that, that uh, doctors in Singapore are, uh, are donating their time for, for the sort of mental health um, of men in a very difficult situation. So. It'd be better if the situation didn't exist, but uh, but when you can do things to try and improve it, it's uh, it's nice. So that's it for me this week, David. Back to you. All right, Gail. Thank you so much for sharing. That was great. Um, let me just uh, summarize uh, Prof. Larson's uh, discussion. Um, she informed us that vaccine hesitancy is not new. Uh, vaccine acceptance is not a given. It is fragile. Uh, vaccine encouragement requires understanding past and current uh, vaccine hesitancy and using that to address fears and to personalize the message. With that, I will now introduce the uh, next week's speaker. Uh, the preview is Professor Peter Piott. He's uh, director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the Handa Professor of Global Health, co-discoverer of the Ebola virus and founding executive director of UN AIDS and associate director of the World Health Organization Global Program on AIDS. 
The title of his talk will be Current Global Efforts on COVID-19 Research and Development. There's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. We would appreciate your feedback. The chat box will be open for another 10 minutes. We welcome your comments. In that chat box, there's also a site to register for July's webinars. We appreciate you doing that in advance. I'd like you to stay safe and remember to wash your hands. And in parting, I know you'll find comfort and humor in the lyrics of the recent upbeat song, Stay Home by the singing duo Big and Rich. Good night.